Hey, folks, I am Kevin Ioli. Welcome to Yahoo Sports. And my guest now, one of the most exciting fighters in the world. And he's going to be fighting on Saturday at UFC Apex, one of the most fight exciting fighters of all time. Going to be a great fight. Uh, the number 10 ranked middleweight in the world, Uriah Hall. Uriah, how are you today? Good. Pretty good. Uh, exciting uh, fight with uh, Anderson Silva. Is he a guy, as you got into MMA, that you had looked to to fight at Sunday? Did you want to match skills with him all the time? Has this been a kind of a dream of yours at all? Uh, it was a dream to meet Anderson Silva. And, of course, with everything happening, uh, being in the UFC, being compared, uh, I guess another dream happened to go up against him. But in the beginning, I remember meeting him saying, I would love to train with this person. And just so happened, I'm going to fight him. Where did you meet him at the first time? And was he still a champion uh, when you guys had met? I met him at one of his, I think when he lost the Weidman. I'm not sure if it's the first or second time. And we just had like a brief moment where he kind of understood where I was in my journey as a martial artist and just gave me some advice to just stay focused and remember how good I am and to go out there and just have some fun. Right. You know, I wonder, that's an interesting thing. Remember how good you are, because obviously you have worlds of talent, uh, you know, being ranked number 10 and you've done so many good things. I, I look, you beat the number one contender at light heavyweight now. So you got to win over uh, over a guy like that. So obviously you can fight. Um, Israel Adesanya, the champion in the division, maybe his worst performance as a UFC fighter came against Anderson Silva. He showed him so much respect. And I wonder how you get past that. You know, you think of who Anderson Silva is, the legend he is. How do you get past it and just go in and, and fight your fight and, and take him as another opponent? Could you repeat that question again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm saying, how do, you, how do you not let, you know, the fact that you like Anderson Silva, that he's such a legend, affect the way you perform in the cage? Like, how do you get past what whatever admiration you have for him and, and just fight, fight your fight? Well, think about it when you want to do something that you need to do. How do you not eat to get fat? How do you do what you're supposed to do to stay healthy? You discipline yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's about discipline and creating that mindset of what needs to be done and separating the things that's going to distract you from that. Seems to me, and I, I wonder if you would agree with this. I mean, one of your strengths as a fighter recently is, you know, uh, your, your mind, you know, it seems like you're a thoughtful guy and that the mental part of MMA has always been something that, you know, has influenced you. And it seems like, you know, you have gotten a lot stronger in that area as, as you've gone along. Have you, has that been something that just comes with experience or is it something, you know, that you're working on to try to improve uh, throughout your career? It's acceptance. That's how I look at it. Like, for instance, I never wanted to be a fighter, ever. I wanted to train, but my sensei decided to make me step outside my comfort zone by making me do something I didn't want to do. And for years, you know, it was I guess that was a thing that uh, I didn't enjoy. It's like public speaking. So a lot of people don't like public speaking because it's uncomfortable. So over the course of the years, it was more of just stepping in there and not really allowing those fears to uh, take over you. And even in my amateur day, actually, I didn't really have any amateur fights. But my first four pro fights, I just, I, I didn't care. It was more like, all right, whatever. But the moment you allow that fear to get in your head, it just kind of hinders. And then you start to doubt. And then there's negative affirmation. There's negative people. And the problem right now, what we have is with social media. And it's easy to access people's opinion without repercussion. Like personally, me being from New York, you say something I don't like, I'll flat out punch you in the face. But I can't do that. I would do that, though. But, of course, my coaches have taught me out of it all the time because that's how I am. I don't believe in disrespect. I will never disrespect someone. Like, why are you disrespecting me? You don't know me. But it's easy. And MMA fans, you know, they, they, they take a toll into that. And me being sensitive because I come from a different background where I never experienced bullying and it happened to me. I never experienced trolling and it happened to me. And the fame, I didn't know how to handle that. There was no guideline principle. Yeah. So I had to learn all of this over the course of the years by myself. And certain individuals who I thought were my confidants at the time end up being my constituents. It's just life. So I look at it as a story, as in as everyone else have their own story. You have your own story of what you do for how you are and where you end up even right now in that chair. Everyone has their story. I have a story where people get to watch. I get to perform on the stage against someone that's of effect to kill me. And there's millions of people watching that. And in watching that, they're going to have their own opinion. And if you're not careful with that, it affects you. It affects you so easily. But I'm not in that world. I, I struggle with that because I don't believe in it. It's like Instagram. I don't believe it. it's fake. There's right. a bunch of bitches on Instagram with 
filters and shaking their ass. I'm like, what the fuck do you do for mankind to have 12 million followers? Yeah. People follow you. What, what do you do? So that world doesn't interest me. So I struggle with that because I have to play into it because I'm a realist. And if I'm a realist trying to be in a fake world, it doesn't mix. I, I think that's a fascinating answer. And, and I, you know, to me, like the definition of courage or one of the definitions of courage is doing something that you don't want to do when, you know, when, you know, when you know, you can be harmed. And I wonder how you got over that. Let's talk about your early fights is your, you know, your sensei is telling you, you have to take a fight. So you're being obedient to him. But in your mind, like, you know, as you're going out there, like when, how did you come to terms with it? And was your heart pounding? Like as, as you're standing in yeah. the only imagine because that's life that, that that's life that life's about risks risk uh meaning to take chances to get to somewhere you've never been before if someone didn't take a risk to f***ing fire a plane we wouldn't have f***ing planes or a risk to make a car we wouldn't have cars you know or a risk to punch someone in the face we wouldn't have entertainment so it's risk and it's taking risk and at that time i guess me never taking risks was a, a fear factor i didn't understand it i didn't want it because it was uncomfortable and i think a lot of people live in that uncomfortable realm and I was one of those, I, I was, I mean, comfortable realm, I should say, but I was one of those, I was comfortable, you know, and to step outside that comfort zone, to me, that's where life begins. And again, over the course of the years, I can't tell you that pinpoint exact moment, just like when you've been with someone for so long, you can't really tell when you fell in love with them, right, right. something had happened. So something had happened at some point where I was like, what am I doing? Or maybe gradually kind of get over things, gradually getting over people's opinion, gradually get out of the discomfort of, uh, where I am, you know, wanted to make a better change for myself. Right now, I can tell you that uh, as I get older, I'm, I'm looking more towards the future. And it's good to stay present, but I don't go too far in the future because that's when you get lost. Sure. When you go too far, it brings anxiety. And of course, if you live in the past, it's going to bring depression. So as present as I am to enjoy this, I try to say, okay, I want to get here. How do I utilize what I have right now to get there? And I think with all that said, that's what kind of helped me to blossom. Hey, do you, do you love MMA now, or is it a means to an end for you? I love the com the competitive nature of it. I don't like the business aspect of it because where I come from as a martial artist, it doesn't contribute to that. It's mm -hmm. it's like boxing. Boxing is just politics, a bunch of trash talking, and people just screwing you with money. I don't come from that. I'm a martial artist, so from a martial arts standpoint, the way I was taught was to do things honorably with integrity. Now throw that into mixed martial arts or the UFC or the world or any type of fighting organization, you're going to be like, what the fuck? When did fighting become politics? Right. Is the, are the politics like when you talk about the rankings or the opponents? Which is a joke. It's a joke. Yeah. When I was ranked 25, I believe, I knocked out Gabe Abbasasi, who was ranked number six, and they put me at 10. What the fuck does that even mean? Yeah. And I was the only one to ever do it. Right. So that's when I was like, this shit is a joke. First of all, who's in charge of that? It's like giving out your tax money. You don't know where the fuck it goes. Yeah. Who's in charge of the ranking system? Who the fuck says that I'm number 10? I'm in my mind, I'm number one. I, what the fuck am I going to take your standards from? Right. What? That makes no fucking sense. But no one knows that. It's more of like, oh, I got to get here because it's business. I'm learning this. I didn't care for it because I didn't pay attention, but I'm learning it. You know, there's a lot of fights I didn't take where before I was like, I'll fight them because I'll fight anybody, right? but certain fights hurt you because certain fights don't get you where you need to be. I didn't care for that stuff because I'm like, I'm a warrior, it doesn't matter, but that's the game. You, you took this fight against Anderson Silva. Uh, you you were, had two fights that were canceled. Uh, both would have been good, you know, good fights for you in the division. Do you think that Anderson Silva had the same cachet now at 45 years old compared to Jacques Array or, or um, uh, Romero that you were supposed to fight? Are you talking about his age factor? Well, no, I'm just talking about where he is in his career and what what a win over Silva would do for you compared to a win over either Jacare or Romero at this point. For me, I think a win over Anderson is more personal than a win over Jacare or any one of these other guys is ranking. You know, it's just to kind of, oh, Jacare, he was ranked this, so let's put him up above this. Uh, Anderson's not really ranked right now, so as much as you know it's a great opportunity because he has a name and everything it still established me but for me it's more a personal thing to go up against one of the best but system wise you know you, you look at one of these guys at the top five it makes more sense so Absolutely. it's politics man
How, uh, I just wanted to, you know, this is your second fight with Fortis MMA. Um, how, how has it gone there? How, what's the change been like? And is it difficult after you're with one group for a long period of time now, you know, kind of getting used to a different way of doing things and adjusting to what the new coaches and the new team, how they do things? Yeah, it's like dancing. Uh, when you dance with someone new, it's always going to, you step on toes, you, you, you mismatch, you, you move a certain way you're not supposed to, it's not fluent. So I personally think, with time, that's going to create that with good communication. Yeah, we bump heads a couple of times because I'm not used to certain things. There's a misconception that I'm hard to deal with, but I'm only hard to deal with if I don't respect you. If I don't respect you, then I'm not going to work with you. It's just right. I value myself too much. But what I loved about it is it was structure. And uh, with the strength and conditioning program, that really sold me because my ex at the time, she invited me out. She kept bragging about it. I'm like, oh, dude, all right, whatever. So I went for a week. I was like, okay, just another dude yelling at people. I've been here before. What's so great about this? It was hard training. So I was like, all right, I've been here too. But what really sold me was the strength and conditioning program. Because within that one week, I've developed such incredible strength. My injuries were kind of misplaced with my strength. And the way he utilized everything and, you know, it generated towards MMA. I was like, I need this. This is great. Mm -hmm. Of course, it slowly developed with, the, with me and Safe as well. And then we just you know, kind of mesh. And he asked me to submit myself to the training, which is hard to do. And I was like, I don't know, man, I'm dynamic. I don't know how to just be a boxer or just do this. And he was like, just trust me, just submit yourself. So I was disciplined. I submitted myself to the training completely and it turned out to be good. That's amazing. You know, when you talk about the strength and conditioning, I wonder, is it something that you look at? Like, you know, do you, do you track it and you, can you see the difference in yourself, say a year ago to now that, you know, that you can follow the difference in improvement you've made? Absolutely. Because uh, I've never, my last, first of all, when I made weight for Jacare, I didn't even try. I didn't even try. It was, I was like, what? And prior to that, when I made weight in Canada for Antonio Carlos Jr., barely tried. And I was like feeling strong and everything. I'm like, I was doing it old school, you know, suck out the water, depleting yourself, not eating for days where he's like, no, you can eat. I'm like, you sure? So again, it's trusting the process. And then when you trust the process, you enjoy the process. And that's what I was doing. And I'm listening to these guys, you know, and I feel like they care. You know, it's easy to get distracted in this world sure. of, of MMA because a lot of people are going to say, yeah, yeah, I got you, bro. And then you've seen a lot of fighters switch camps. And the reason why they're switching camps, because at the end of the day, it's about the fighter. And this guy behind me right here, Clayton, he was like my my, <laughs> he was my boxing coach and uh i worked with him for years since i met him on the ultimate fighter and one of the the, the key things he, he told me was hey if there's there's it's, a, it's about growth and he's always telling me to establish myself now because i'm not going to do it forever and you know i heard that before but it didn't really hit home and then the the biggest thing he ever told me was hey if there's someone else that can get you to a bigger level you know i'm, I'm still I'm, I'm with you because it's about you at the end of the day and a lot of coaches don't understand that. I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm this. I'm that. I'm that. When they forget, uh, yeah, buddy, you kind of helped me get there, but I'm the one that's, you know, doing the finishing torch. You're the one that took the fight. <laughs> exactly. So it's it's him having that mindset to uh, value me and value what I want more. Kind of just made me look at the sport differently with a lot of people with coaches. And I'm picky now. I'm, I'm streaming picky. And um, just to wrap up a couple more questions that, you know, at your age, 36 years old, uh, can you still have that big improvement? I mean, can you keep, you know, keep going up when you're, you kind of at a level, you know, where, okay, I, I work with these guys that got me to a certain level. I'm there. Or do you feel like you still have more to give in terms of your ability in the cage? Uh, you know, it's, I, I watched a, a story that ESPN did on me and Anderson. I thought about it. I said it, I, I feel like I said it first. I call myself Benjamin Button. I'm aging backwards. I am twice as fast as I was, maybe faster. I know so much more. And the age factor is here. The moment you believe you're old, then, then guess what? You're fucked. You're old. Right. It's a mindset. It's how you carry yourself. This guy's fucking 65 years old. He has abs. I have people asking him what's his workout. He's like, <laughs> uh, what are you talking about? He complains when he has knee injury because he feels like he shouldn't have any knee injury. So it's a mindset. It's how you look at yourself. You can be 105. But when you believe you're 105, guess what? You're a fucking 105. So it's a mindset of how you carry yourself, how you think. I don't believe in this age factor thing. I'm a human being. I get injured and all that stuff. But it's how you take care of yourself. The right stuff you put into your body. I consider myself a Ferrari. Ferrari needs high maintenance. 
Well, this for those Ferraris can also go fast and do a lot of amazing things, as okay. can uh, my man here, Uriah Hall. Uriah, <laughs> great uh, interview. Thank you so much for your time. Best of luck you. on Saturday against Anderson Silva. Thank you very much. Thanks, my man. Be well.